Aside from making you laugh, the mark of a true satire is its ability to illuminate the ills of society that lurk right beneath the surface. And that's exactly what today's film did. Howdy. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insights into the creative process of storytelling. Folks, I couldn't be happier with today's lineup because we have actor and writer Sasha Baron Cohn, joined by his co-writers, Ant Hines, Dan Mazur, Dan Swimmer, Jenna Friedman, and Peter Bainham to discuss their latest film, Borat subsequent movie film. And you know, I really love this film and this is just a great ensemble of writers to have together because they really illuminate the process to make this film and they show all the deep writing that went into it. It's one thing to improvise, but you can't really improvise the way that they do in this film without having a lock solid path, a conversation path, an outline for the story at hand and thematics that come to play in the movie. So, you know, they were very forthcoming about their creative process and what it took to make this difficult film under difficult circumstances. So I know you'll dig this episode. And speaking of things to dig, I hope you'll check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You know, you could read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. And if you've never read us before, I hope you test drive us by reading the free issue. And of course, if you dig the free issue, we hope that you'll consider becoming a subscriber. And if you want to do that, I'm happy to offer you a discount coupon code of SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five. That'll save you $5 off a one-year subscription to Backstory Magazine. Of course, we are the only magazine in the world that publishes screenplays in their entirety, a accompanied by interviews with the screenwriters. We also interview directors, actors, producers, editors, TV showrunners, even playwrights and novelists. Storytelling is our game, folks. So we hope you check out everything in our current issue over at Backstory.net. And thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. You know, I say this every couple episodes. If you're only listening in the podcast, make sure to go over to the Backstory Magazine YouTube page. Because over there, you could watch these interviews as well. You could watch the Zoom casts that they're emanating from. And I say the same to our YouTube listeners. If you've never listened to our podcast before, you could find the Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast over in Spotify or iTunes. So I just wanted both those worlds to know about each other. And now you do. But now, without any further ado, let's get right into our chat with actor and co-writer Sasha Baron Cohn, along with co-writers Ant Hines, Dan Swimmer, Dan Mazur, Peter Bainham, and Jenna Friedman about their latest film, Borat, subsequent movie film. Okay, you guys, uh, congrats on on Borat, subsequent movie film. I absolutely loved it. And we're going to get right into a chat about it. But before we do, I think it's I think it's important to go back to the beginning. And Sasha, I'm just curious what kind of inspired you to choose a comedic route that involved you interviewing real people as a fake interviewer, all the going all the way back to Dolly G show. Um, that was starting to happen in the 90s in England. And really the precursor to it that I could name would be something like Candid Camera. So it was it was just dormant for a while, and it was a type of comedy that you definitely helped revive. Um, thank you very much. I mean, I had seen Candid Camera. We had a version of that called Beatles About. <laughs> that was really a prank show uh, where you were tricking members of the public. I mean, what I stumbled into was the idea of creating a character and that character interacting with real people. And I was really influenced by... The reality show, actually, it's prior to reality shows. There was a show in England called Blind Date uh, with this woman called Scylla Black was the host of it. And it was people, I don't know whether they had it in America. It was people would ask questions of uh, somebody of the opposite sex on a different side of this um, divider. And then they'd end up together, you know, they'd choose three. And what was interesting to me at the time, this was... I think 1994, 95, was that the audience, this is going to sound incredibly obvious, that the audience at home loved watching real members of the public more than they loved watching actors. And I, the first character I did was an early form of Ali G. Then I did an early form of Borat. This was sort of 1994 or five. And in my first pitch, I had to write the treatment And I wrote this kind of theory. I go, you know, the evidence is pointing to the fact that 
people love watching real people. Um, and I didn't actually convince the commissioner and she said, forget it. This was like a version of Ball Rat living in a house of students for three months undercover. Um, but yeah, that was it. I mean, I, I basically, I was out shooting a, an early form of Ali G for this tiny little cable show that I was doing. And then I saw some skateboarders who looked like my character and I was with this director and I said, shall I go and interact with them? And he goes, yeah, do it. I started interacting with them and these guys started shouting. We go, man, you're crap at skateboard. You was whack. Da, da, da. And I'm, and then eventually I said, wait a minute, I'm joking. This is a, I'm putting on a character. And I really, they were surprised. And at that point, um, I carried on shooting for an hour, went completely bonkers. And that was the first time I kind of stumbled into this style of, you know, of comedy. I, I think what separates it, and, and we're going to get to the movies in a minute, but just to dwell is that what you evolved to was kind of going for some public figures that aren't the, aren't the greatest people. And you were shining a light on them and giving them enough rope to hang themselves. But as Ollie G first, but then eventually as Borat, how did you start leaning into that in, in which you would realize that there was, a, you know, what we would now call a social justice warrior aspect to the work? Huh. Uh, well, so Ali G became, uh, was formulated on a show called The 11 Fox Show. And I uh, worked with the aunt and Dan who are here. So we've been, um, yeah, we're working with, with each other for 22 years. 23, it, I think, 98. Bloody hell. It makes yeah. it sound very, we were extremely young. I was four at the time. No, <laughs> and I think at that point it was, the, I, that was a very simple comic premise, which was the world's most stupid person on a subject next to the world's most educated person on the subject. And would that expert suffer the fool? And so I created this character, Ali G. It had been based on an earlier version of a character that I'd come up with. And I don't know if it was deeply satirical. What it showed was the complete lack of awareness of the sort of ruling class in England or those who are at the top of academic institutions, that they believed that somebody as stupid as Ali G could exist. You know, it, was, it sort of was an indicator of their disregard for the youth, that they believed that somebody could not, you know, understand the concept of infinity or think that... Um, you know, man had walked on the sun, you know, just these idiot. It, it relied on that basic disregard and disrespect for young people. And to Dan, what do you remember about the genesis of the Borat character since you were there? Um, it's interesting because we, we really focused on the Ali G character to begin with. And it was sort of a phenomenon in the UK and that kind of transcended other comedies that were around at the time and was making headlines on the front pages and everybody was talking in that voice. So we were nervous and skeptical that we could create something with that sort of impact and uh, that sort of reach. And frankly, something that would be that funny. And Sasha had this pre-existing character that we then had to develop and, and help evolve. And it's sort of incomprehensible to uh, it would have been incomprehensible to us then that Borat would go on and be more popular than Ali G. We always thought, oh, God, it might just end up being the the slightly less good second character. But I think it was... A I should say that, but if I could just interject. Do you remember, Dan, we went out and the first time we took Borat out for the Ali G show, we went to Cambridge University, and then Dan, I interviewed somebody, and the person afterwards said to his friend, oh, it's just somebody doing a shit version of Ali G. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's, you know, it, again, sort of now that we're here and, you know, as I say, sort of probably 20 years on from that moment, the fact that it's, the you know, Sasha's most beloved character and the one with the longest life is, you know, we never would have predicted it then, I, I, I don't think. 
And yeah, what's something that you remember? I remember Borat actually sort of being fairly fully formed right from the offset. And he hasn't. Uh, and I, I had no idea that Sasha had this character and had been developing. And, and I was just blown away by him. And, yeah, he hasn't changed that much over the years. I think basically what's been added to him is backstory, his his family and friends and careers. And, and it's just been sort of adding to what was what was there from day one, really. I would say with Bull Rat, actually, you're talking about these. I mean, I wouldn't call myself a social justice warrior, but Bull Rat was more political and more satirical than Ali G. The first time I took out Bull Rat, which I think I was 24 years old, I was doing a tiny cable show. Um, and I stood in for a presenter, they used to call him a host, who had to, yeah, I think he had personal problems. Um, let's not go into them. We well, you know what they were. And so I urgently needed to stand in. On that day, there was a march of many members of the upper class in England to protest the right to hunt foxes. And I thought, oh, these are great targets. And I went undercover as, I think Borat was from Moldova at that point. He had a different name. But again, it was the same. It was more for satirical aim because I was going to, and I go, in my country, we uh, hunt the Jews. We give them, you know, 30 minutes and then we uh, chase after them. Would you do that here? And people go, well, I suppose, well, um, uh, how many, if it was 30 minutes and it was fair, then, you know, I suppose so. If it was sportsman, you know, and then I realized at that point, oh, Borat is this way to enable people to drop their guard and reveal what they would say behind closed doors because they felt that this was never going to be on British TV. And so it was always my secret secondary character that I hoped would, you know, make it. But I thought it was going to be probably too, too satirical to be, to become mass. We're going to, we're going to get to to the sequel in a minute, but I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the first film. And I think it's important to note that the first film was nominated for an Oscar and a WGA award for screenwriting. Because not only were the characters so extraordinary, but so was the storytelling and the journey that the audience was brought on. And I had the pleasure of talking to Ant and to Peter. And one of the things that they brought up as a big lesson, Sasha, I just want to ask you about this moment as well, was that the the early iteration with Phillips, right, with 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 Todd Phillips, they they said that basically what it boiled down to was it was a it was a defiance of the funny man straight man pairing in which one person was inherently funny, one was straight and always correcting the funny man. And it seemed like the lesson there was that taking away the straight man from the formula and introducing a character like Azamat as the sidekick who was as clueless as Borat was, I think, one of the things when you guys retooled it and stopped going in that direction on the first film that saved it. Sasha, could you tell us what you think about that formula and, and killing kind of the straight man idea from it? Well, no, you still have the straight man idea, but you had to, you know, we were very, think about it. Okay, the first Borat movie seemed like an impossibility. Um, I'd, done, we'd, I'd done one movie prior to that with Dan, which was scripted. And I, you know, for me, I wanted to do a movie that was based in reality, that had the energy of me playing a character with real people at that point it seemed impossible there had been reality shows but it seemed impossible to get real people to unwittingly push the narrative forward yeah that seemed like an impossible thing to do um and it, that so really Borat the first Borat was an experiment it was that was, you know, more than, you know, we still had, into, you know, you can analyze the individual scenes and say, okay, in this scene, Borat, you know, the crazy one, this person's playing the straight guy. But the question was, how do you turn this from a series of sketches into a narrative? Uh, and the way to do that is to have a buddy comedy. So we used two different formulas. One was the buddy comedy and the second one was road, the road trip. And we were pretty rigorous. I mean, I remember, you know, with Peter and Ant just spending 
you know, on and off for a couple of months, we looked through every single successful road trip. We tried to analyze what were the common themes that they had. And we looked at every successful bunny comedy and, you know, all the classics. And, and so, for example, one thing that we noticed in every buddy comedy was halfway through, there's a fight and the two split up. And then, so our thing was, what's the twist? Um, in our one, I, I remember saying to Peter and Anne, I go, I once had an idea for a detective character who was naked. He was like the best detective. There's a crime that has to be solved. There's only one person who can solve it. The problem is he's a nudist. And so there was going to be like real violence but him being naked. We talked about that and that then that led into the naked fight. So the structure of it was completely traditional. And, you know, you know, when Dan came on, we were also, you know, we were very, very cognizant of the fact that this had to feel and have the structure and the, didn't have to be a stereotypical movie, but it had to, it had to follow a cert, certain rules of a body comedy and a, and a, um, a road movie. And so one of those things is what is the body? And then we went, you know, we looked at kind of different clown acts and it's a kind of Laurel and Hardy clown act where one, you normally have one of the clowns is slightly less stupid than the other one, you know, or slightly less naive. And that is Azamat. Azamat is the angry, slightly less stupid one who's saying, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And it's that tension and that conflict that eventually is going to lead to a bust up. But you want to see some love underneath it. But the no, whole... I, I, would, I, I would add, I think the high wire act as a writer that you're, you're trying to perform here is to write a story that sort of has a conventional and satisfying narrative and then get that to happen in the real world with people who are not aware that they are contributing to it. And... I think we were more ambitious, certainly in the second movie than the first. Um, but that's the challenge with this. I think the other challenge as well is that, because when I first came out to, to work on the movie and they, they'd been trying a much looser version or, you know, with, with Todd Phillips, where I think it had been, let's just go out with the camera and see what happens. And that, that hadn't worked. And like Sasha said, we had a, luckily Sasha, well, unluckily Sasha had broken his foot and it allowed us a few months of downtime to figure out a story. But um, but then I remember seeing a lot of footage uh, that they they shot and crying with laughter at this stuff. But then you get 30, 40 minutes in and you're laughing a little bit less and a little bit less and a little bit less because you realise you could, it's just like eating the same thing over and over again. So the storyline was partly about being able to keep an audience interest and to have a story driving forward. But also the bigger thing is, and like Sasha said, the purpose of this in the first place was to be satirical. So you're trying to do a story that's interesting and funny and has all the right beats, but you're also, on the other hand, trying to have encounters with people that illuminate, in this particular movie, or these two movies, obviously the bigger purpose is illuminating something about the world or about the people you're meeting. So that's where it gets really difficult, because you can have scenes that might be fantastic in terms of storytelling, but got nothing to say <laughs> about the world. And in this, there are scenes in both movies that are just pure comedy, obviously. But also there's that level. And I think that's what's harder about this type of movie than just about any other scripted movie, really. Is. Well, I absolutely love the first movie. And, and I was so glad that we got the second one right at the perfect moment before the election. Just it was such a close election that anything that could sway any votes was so important. So it was so great that you guys got the team back together. But something I want to talk about the second movie, just going again, what we were talking about with this pairing. You know, Jenna, you and you and Erica, I would I would assume would have some contributions here. It was the introduction of Tutar, Borat's daughter, um, you know, replacing Azamat in the second film and tackling misogyny, starting with the concept of these fake abortion clinics, you know, part of the crisis pregnancy center uh, network, which try and trick girls into keeping their babies, sometimes even lying about the ultrasound results. It was it was a real triumph to see that it also solved the problem truly of the success of Borat in which as they, as they found on who is America, 
disguises started needing to be implemented for Sasha to interview folks. So Jenna, talk about what you remember with, with the character of Tudor. Well, it was such an opportunity um, to kind of look at America through like a female Borat, um, especially the past four years under Trump. I mean, there's so much misogyny. The comedy kind of like writes itself um, with the pregnancy crisis center scene specifically, those places are really interesting. As of 2018, they're legal. There are more fake abortion clinics than real ones in America. And they're really hard to make fun of. And the fact that this movie shows one and shows it in a funny way, but obviously it's a real thing. I mean, that I feel like that was such a triumph um, for the film. And I remember when we were working on that scene, kind of wondering you know, what, what's this person going to say? And I think to the point about like, when you go out and how you write these kinds of scenes, they are harder than scripted projects because you are basically writing a script before you shoot something. And then you also have to anticipate what someone's going to say and pivot if they go a different way. So it's almost like you're writing multiple scenes for one scene. Um, and also like relying on the brilliance of Borat to be able to like improvise and change things with the pregnancy crisis center scene specifically. I remember we were wondering like, you know, how far can you push it? What is this person going to say? And the fact that like we knew going in that he was like such a zealot that he would probably be okay with like a father impregnating his child. Like it's so disgusting. <laughs> But that's also like perfect satire because you can, you know, you can't push that. We, we couldn't believe that he would go that far. And then the other say, by the way, Jen is being very modest. She came up with yes. that thing, right? She came in, she said, we've got to do something about the pregnancy crisis center. Yes. And I, I didn't even know what they were. And my, I would, I think we were a little bit worried. We were like, hold on, how are we going to do a joke about something that the audience don't know exists? Uh, but yeah, she really pushed it and then she came up with the basic concept and then we turned it into a sequence. And I think it's a really nice sequence of so the cupcake leads to her swallowing the baby, which leads to the basic misunderstanding, which, you know, I mean, we looked at when we were writing the final version of that scene uh, we looked about looked at something about Mary, where there's the the scene where there's the misunderstanding about the hitchhiker, um, and so yeah, it was a basic comedy scene, a bit basic misunderstanding, but with a deeply powerful bit of satire underneath it. Well, here's the triumph of the sequel, and it's 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 really the theme in which in America we're all so divided and we're sworn on either sides of these lines. And so is Borat, really, from everything that we've known about him. So it was interesting that you chose to have enlightenment for Borat and actually have his mind changed about misogyny and protection of his own daughter, you know, going back to the cheesy, oh, I'm a father of a daughter comment that you always hear from some of the most misogynist people around. But Borat does go through change. Just for all of you, Dan Swimmer, I know you haven't said anything yet. Like, like. Talk about using- you're not missing anything. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just talk about using yeah. that 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 impetus for change because it's kind of the surprise of the movie to see Borat change his mind because he so rarely does from everything we've seen previously. Yeah, I think you're quite right to bring that up. Like we, we were always very very careful talking about can he change because really he shouldn't. You know, using the rules of sort of scripted comedy generally, uh, and that, you know unless you're going to burn the character forever. And so he essentially he can, but in tiny increments, I suppose, is the answer. Um, and like you said, it takes an extreme, extreme example to get him to move that tiny bit. You know, that's uh, but um, I, he's not going to change much more than that. I think there is a change. I mean, you know, Dan's completely right in that Borat's got to be funny at the end. So we can't. He can't go through too much enlightenment, but what he does change on is he starts off as a huge misogynist and he ends up as a feminist, right? And that is, again, you, you know, what we're trying to do and the big aim here, the really ambitious thing was, can we do a movie with real people where the audience know that myself and Maria are fake actors, that we're real actors playing fake characters in the real world, 
but can we get them to actually care about the movie? And I think that's the real triumph of this movie, that actually it's quite moving. And you people go, oh, I really cared about the story and I wanted Borat to get back together with you know, his daughter and I wanted them to have some resolution. The way to do that, and again, we spent months just looking and trying to give ourselves a film course on all two types of movies. One, father-daughter stories, and secondly, kind of arranged marriage stories. So we looked at Paper Moon and Monsoon Wedding, and we looked at Bend It Like Beckham. And um, it happened one night. Remember that one? Yes, it happened. Well, it happened one night. It was interesting because that was a different structure we were looking at, which was essentially it's a romance. It's a rom-com thing. So in it happened one night. We really analysed it because it's almost the perfect and original rom-com where you see that he has this epiphany. Oh my God, I love her. And he has the race back to, to get her. People didn't normally associate that with the graduate, but look at, for all of those watching this, I urge you to just watch the beauty and the perfect writing of It Happened One Night. And we actually replicated that mid-act three turnabout in the central character, which is Borat. And then what is the, how does he get that epiphany? We had a lot of discussion. We were going to get it from a, he was going to sit down with the therapist. therapist. Mm -hmm. And then Janice, the babysitter, was so fantastic that we thought, hold on, could what Janice... He hasn't figured it out, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> could Janice bring about that realisation that he loves his daughter? Because at that point, you know, we're in Act 3, he's mission accomplished. Borat has done everything that he was meant to do. He has delivered his daughter to Rudy Giuliani, done, I'm going to go home as a hero. And it's that moment of, hold on, I love her, and I am going to sacrifice my love, my life, so that she can live her own life, right? And for him to do that, he has to become a feminist. And it's, it's, no it's an amazing arc. So we noticed in a lot of those, that was the similar thing of these misogynistic or patriarchal societies where they say, you know what? You are a woman, you are, um, you know, your job as a woman is to be, uh, to be the property of your father until the day you are the property of your husband. So to go from that philosophy to the idea of, I have a right to choose who I am. I have a right to choose what I do with my body, which is, you know, what Jenna brilliantly came up with too. I have a right to choose what I do with my own life. And then to, you know, discuss how that, how in some ways in contemporary America, women, you know, had a similar lack of choice to how they would do in a place like Saudi Arabia. So despite all the great strides of feminism and education, whatever there were in many states, women were denied basic uh, fundamental rights. You know, there's a misconception people sometimes have about a movie like this being all improvised, but we're sitting here with a bunch of writers. It is written. And even the little touches like the daughter's owner's manual were, were just hilarious to see. And I hope you guys put that online one day. But I just want to talk process for a second. From my conversations with, with Peter and Ant, they explain the process of an outline, figuring out the journey, knowing that it's going to change, coming up with the alternate lines. But they said it all comes down to a big table read and rehearsals that you had with Maria. And, and I'm just curious, what were the biggest lessons from that table read of what you guys had cobbled together as a script that was something big that maybe needed to change before you went out on the road? Well, I, I think one of the um, things about the table read is that it's, it's it, you know, because it is scripted, but on the other hand, nobody apart from Sasha and Maria, basically in the movie, is even aware they're in a movie. Right. <laughs> so the cast, you've got this cast of people who are helping move the story forward or you are, you know, so we are, so the writing is, is, is part, it's scripted in the sense of it's planned and lots of writing and lots of, you know, prepared things. But on the other hand, it's partly also about creating situations in which these people can move the story forward. And so when you get somebody like Janice coming oh. into that, who was, I love, I loved her so much because the first time she meets Borat, she has a reaction that nobody in that this movie, and I think really not really in the previous movie, had ever had before, where they go, you're full, they basically say you're full of shit, and you can tell, you see the look on her face. 
she's thinking, no, this is not happening. I'm not accepting this guy's worldview. And so that was, she, she was just wonderful. But like you, that, so that's pretty, pretty amazing. But um, uh, I think I've lost my thread completely. <laughs> the table reads, table I reads. Think, I think, no, but I think, I think your say, point's really. Say, oh, go on, sorry. Sorry, Dan, Dan, Dan. I, I, would no, say no, one I, think, I think what we mentioned before about finding Janice and, uh, and discovering her early and then thinking, you know what, this is golden, this is fantastic. And and we need to go back because there's something really powerful that we couldn't ever have envisaged in a, in a table read. And then rewriting and reshaping the plot, as we mentioned, to then bring Janice back into it and become more of an element just because we realised how wonderful she was. That's what's unique about the the filmmaking process that, that we have on these movies is that, you know, as opposed to... Um, you know, on a traditional movie where you're spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of millions on sets that are built in advance and you're committed to those, there's a fluidity and flexibility in the writing process that we can adapt pretty swiftly to what we shoot and rewrite and reshape and remould the narrative so that um, so that we can incorporate that that really good stuff. And that just makes us very fleet of foot and, you know, and and hopefully just keeps it really fresh. Ooh, hey, I'm jumping in really quick to remind you to check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You could read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. You know, if you've never checked us out, we hope you'll take the time to check out our free issue because we are the only magazine in the world that publishes screenplays in their entirety, along with interviews with the screenwriters. Plus, we also interview playwrights, directors, actors, editors, TV showrunners and even novelists and comic book writers. So there is so much to explore over at backstory.net that I really hope you check out what's inside our latest issue. And you know, if you decide you want to become a subscriber and we'd love to have you, I'm happy to offer you a discount coupon code of SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five, and that'll work on a one year subscription over at backstory.net. So look, it would mean a lot for me to have my podcast listeners support my passion project. So thanks for considering. Considering. And just another note, in case you're only listening as a podcast, remember you could watch the YouTube version of this interview because it was a Zoom cast. So you could watch the writers speak over in the Backstory Magazine YouTube page. So keep that in mind as well. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right back into our interview with actor and co-writer Sasha Baron Cohn, joined by co-writers Ant Hine, Dan Mazur, Dan Swimmer, Jenna Friedman, and Peter Bainham about their latest film, or at subsequent movie film. I would add to that. I would add to that that we start the process in a conventional way. So we write an outline and then we write a full, you know, 110 page final draft conventional script and we have a table read. But you come out of that table read knowing that with the best will in the world, perhaps 50% of that script you can actually make happen in the real world for whatever reason. And yeah, the writing process is ongoing and continuous and and you know that's partly what makes it exciting it's like you don't you you hope and predict what you're going to get out of it but ultimately you're kind of a slave to the you know yeah. it's difficult because a table it. read can can never compete comedically with a real person saying mm -hmm. those things I, I, so it I can be quite confusing, confusing. We did the, so this was the first time that we'd done a table read, actually. The first ball wrap, the structure was si simple enough that we didn't need a table read. But I think the writing in this, we knew that it was far more complex and far more hard to achieve. Because, again, we needed this to be hilarious. We needed it to be compelling for 90 minutes. We needed it to be satirical. And we needed it to be emotionally engaging. And so we came to this conclusion like there's no way we can go out like we did on the first Borat movie and shape it afterwards. We need to know exactly, you know, what's the ratio of these scenes between Tuta and her dad and the scripted scenes, you know. We knew that, you know, this would have to work as a, you know, romantic comedy as well of the first Kazakh father to ever fall in love with his daughter and the first Kazakh daughter to ever reject her father. And one last thing, that table read, the one lesson that came out of it, and we had, you know, Lord and Miller there, we had Spike Jones, we had every, you know, Jay Roach, we had every brilliant comedy director in Hollywood turn up. The one thing that came out of it was they said, 
obviously this is scripted and you're just casting actors to play Rudy Giuliani and Mike Pence. We're like, no, this is going to be real. And they were, you're completely out of your mind. This is impossible. <laughs> so that was, that's what came out of it. We're well, like, oh, the movie works. If we cast it, it's going to be impossible to make. And that was before COVID. You know, a good, a good thing, though, the good thing that we didn't expect, well, was when Maria was cast, she was clearly fantastic. But I don't think anyone quite predicted how fantastic she and her dynamic with Sasha would yeah, be. Yeah, that's true. It's like nobody, you know, we, we just thought it was a big, that was a big uh, swing. It was a big risk to sort of, to, 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 to cast somebody, somebody completely unknown, who can go head to head with Sasha. And it was, it's, she's incredible. It's like a miracle. She's so, it's so good and it works so well. How much rehearsal was there when you're talking in a foreign language, Sasha? Because, you know, there's a lot of subtitles. You're talking in front of other people in a foreign language, but it seems very scripted. Was that all scripted and rehearsed? Yeah, it's yeah. We rehearsed, every, we rehearsed every scene in English first. And then she was speaking in Bulgarian. <laughs> and then I was taking some phrases from the Bulgarian, mixing it in with some Hebrew, some Polish. Okay. Um, had to, had to ask that because I was and, curious. Yeah, but we, you know, we, you know, again for that movie to work, that emotional dynamic has to be specific. So you, you know, she can't suddenly have a breakup and say, "Dad, I'm leaving. I've found a new way." You have to see that. So um, there's a moment in the plastic surgeon where she's paying, Borat's paying for her plastic surgery. And she's completely happy and overjoyed. And she has this realization where Borat says, oh, you know, I'm going to give her and then I'm going to return to Kazakhstan. She realizes her father's going to abandon her. And we realized we needed to seed all of those moments, have them perfectly played in the moment, but make sure that, or, you know, that entire relationship of her father falling in love with his daughter, a daughter rejecting her father, then agreeing to sacrifice her own happiness to save her own father's life, her father doing the op- doing exactly the same, you know, right. sacrificing his own life for his daughter's happiness. And in the end, there being a resolution where they have a new relationship based on equality and mutual respect. We knew that, that would, there were about 18 points, story points that need to be conveyed perfectly. So we were very, very, this had the, ingenuity and difficulty of writing a complicated romance while engineering that in the you know randomness of shooting well and it was good that you explained people. that you rehearsed it in english right. because you can't just improvise those emotions and those conversations that are in a foreign language you you have to know the intention but you know look the road to hell is paved with good intentions you had this 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 table read that you did you're ready to go out and shoot and then covid hit and I just, you know, one, one thing I really want to hear about for a moment is the, the, the Jerry and Jim stuff was great and you put yourself at risk, but the real risk you put yourself at was that rally. Because in light of what happened January 6th, we know how violent some of these misguided Trump supporters can become. And I'm curious about knowing how far you were going to the edge at the rally as country Steve when you were singing the song and getting the crowd riled up and knew you needed to leave. So Sasha, I want to hear from you and, and any of the other writers could pitch in as well. Cause that was the furthest to the edge you guys went on this film. And I, I commend you for doing it, but I'm, that was, that was a close one. Sorry. Wait a minute. I'm worried about my battery. Okay. <laughs> um, listen, this is not a normal movie, right? People, you know, these writers don't go out and go on the road and risk getting arrested and do these crazy hours just for the sake of it. And for, it's wonderful that we've had recognition, but we were doing this for the election, right? We did everything we could to ensure that this came out a week before the election. We felt we as writers and as performers had to dissent that this is our way of protesting we felt we couldn't be bystanders. We were very angry. We were furious at what was happening. And we felt that democracy was perilously close to being destroyed. We didn't necessarily think we could have a big impact, but we felt we we had to do what we could, right? What can we do? Everyone 
listening to this, you know, what can you do as artists when something horrific is happening? And the thing you can do is you can go and you can work. And so everyone here and everyone in the crew was ready to get, ready to risk getting COVID, was ready to risk getting attacked, was ready to risk going to jail. And on this rally, they were ready to get shot because there were hundreds of people with semi-automatic weapons. We knew that they were going to get angry. And this was extremely dangerous. So we're talking about an incredibly brave crew and an incredibly brave group of writers who were all there on the day. It came very close. You know, they stormed the stage eventually and one of them pulled a pistol out. You know, was he going to shoot me? I don't know, but... I think that was the you know, intention. We were very lucky that we <laughs> had somebody really to, to grab his hand, you know, but we knew that that rally was going to be extremely dangerous. We felt that it was crucial to show the dangers that lay ahead, right? And it was almost a, you know, it had, you know, it had echoes of what we saw at the Capitol. I mean, many of the, those groups were at the Capitol. And, you know, we were told at that rally that if people found out that you were not Republicans, that they would get COVID positive people to spit on you. So forget about the guns. And then we, you know, we had an amplifier built that was basically would withstand 100 rounds of ammunition. So the idea was if people really started shooting en masse at me, that I'd dive behind there and somehow I would get out. But you know, I, you know, ran off stage into a waiting getaway vehicle and we were surrounded, myself and the director, Jason Walliner, the crowd were banging. They, you know, had AR-15s. And at one point they pulled open the door and tried to drag me out of the ambulance. Uh, and I was, you know, pulling the door shut for dear life. Then they chased us with motorbikes and the whole crew, everyone here had to move hotel that night because there were certain groups who had identified members of the crew, put their photos up online and were searching for us in Washington state, right? So in terms of the bravery, I do not know of any other movie that's been made in history where the, you know, the writers and the crew and the director of this brave, you know, well, we were, we were putting ourselves at risk, but we were doing it because we, we couldn't look ourselves in the mirror on November the 4th knowing that we hadn't done what we could to put out put a movie out there and just say that we we dissented we disagreed i'd agree uh, with that like I, i've always been skeptical i'm going to go and get a, i'm going to go and get a battery you carry on you go i've always been skeptical when people talk about art making a difference and all that it's just especially as brits you just think oh yeah right you know but with this it did feel like important this uh this kind of thing and i mean it's weird because like with the, the I remember with the Rudy Giuliani thing that, that the week that after our movie came out and the whole thing, or just when the whole Rudy Giuliani thing blew up, it just so happened it was happening at the time that that ludicrous Hunter Biden story where they were just running with that sort of yeah. thing. And we took the headlines. And I think <laughs> even if that's a small difference that we made in that moment, you know, there was this... It was sketchy. It was like kind of scary in that run up to the election. It was kind of crazy, really. It was like, just which way is this going to go? It could have gone a bunch of different ways. But sorry, yeah. what were you going to say, Jenna? Oh, just in terms of like impactfulness, like even um, not as scary, but I remember on Halloween after the movie came out, um, if you looked on Instagram, all of these girls were dressed as Maria with like from the dead scene with like their periods all over their clothes. And it's a silly thing, but for young girls to see that as like a role model, it kind of destigmatizes periods in a really kind of cool, funny way. Um, so that was just something that I thought was really funny. <laughs> Well, look, you, you guys, you guys have been very generous with your time. You, you really succeeded. You made a difference in history. I'm sure this, this swung a few voters. 
the writing, the time you put into, everybody appreciates it. And I would say the anti-racist work that you did in this movie as well, you know, even just with the Holocaust denialism with Judy and, and Doris, you know, that was another great scene. But you, you guys have been very generous with your time. So thanks so much for, for talking about writing it today. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. I love the film. <laughs> thank you very yes. much. And that's how the Q&A went down. Special thanks again to actor and co-writer Sasha Baron Cohn, along with co-writers Ant Hines, Dan Mazur, Dan Swimmer, Jenna Friedman, and Peter Bainham for being so generous with their time in discussing their latest film, Borat, subsequent movie film. And folks, if you haven't seen it, please go watch it because it really is something special. You know, while you're surfing around online, I hope you'll also check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You can read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. You know, if you've never read us before, you could check out our free issue over there. And if you decide you want to become a subscriber, and I hope you do, you could use coupon code SAVE5 to save $5 off a one-year subscription. Remember, we're the only magazine in the world that publishes screenplays in their entirety, accompanied by screenwriter interviews. We also interview directors, actors, editors, TV showrunners, playwrights, and even comic book artists and novelists storytelling is our game. So look, it really means a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and YouTube watchers check out my passion project, Backstory Magazine. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2021. All rights reserved. Folks, if you want to reach out to me, you could always find me on Twitter as Yo Goldsmith. I also run the Twitter account for Backstory Magazine, which is Backstory underscore mag. And those same handles work over on Instagram. So you could find Yo Goldsmith on Instagram or Backstory underscore mag on Instagram. I have a Facebook fan page. I don't use it too often, but I'll try and use it a little more. You could always email me at yo goldsmith at gmail.com. And I absolutely promise not to respond immediately, but I try and respond when I can. So just don't hold me to an immediate response. Look, I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory Magazine and the host of the Q&A, thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.